Okay, so welcome back after the coffee break. Uh, we will continue now with a view on a more synergetic view of remote sensing. Um, I will give the talk together with Zirke. We are splitting it in half. Um, it's entitled The Use of Remote Sensing of Clouds and Precipitation for Improved Weather Forecasting and Warning. Until now, you learned a lot about radar more from scientific perspective. You will see scientific perspective of satellites the next day. And I want to introduce you more towards how remote sensing is actually used in um, operational weather warning and weather forecasting. Um, OK, so why do we want to do now casting at all? Why do we want to look at? severe weather events for a short time period. Extreme weather events um, can be deathly and um, a threat to life, property, economy, and so on. There are lots of phenomena that are um, important, like hail, tornado, heavy precipitation, wind gusts, and so on. So um, that's why National Weather Service have to provide warnings for various customers, and the biggest customer are all of you, so it's the general public, as well as people like emergency manager, aviation, and so on. So for instance, on the right, you see the warning criteria used at the German National Weather Service, DWD. There are different thunderstorm warnings depending on what phenomena you expect, whether you will have strong gusts or storm force gust, whether you have hail or not, whether you've got strong precipitation or not. So, but how do you do um, to actually give a warning? So let's look at an example. Actually, um, if you would imagine you would see this in a 2D radar reflectivity plot, you would see that there's a um, strong precipitation cell here somewhere. But the question you will have to answer as a forecaster is, which has it occurred? Will the cell intensify or will it decrease? And where will it go in the future? So, and then once you answer this question for yourself, um, you will have to issue a warning. So you will have to decide which kind of warning do I want to issue or do I have to issue? And which category as well as which county? So as an example, again, here's a map of Germany and you see which counties have got a current thunderstorm warning in a certain category, so it's an orange warning right now. And then you would, as a customer, you could click on a map and see for your county for which time this warning is valid and what kind of phenomena are expected. For instance, here it's a warning for thunderstorm of heavy precipitation and it will last for an hour. So what kind of data can be used um, as an operational forecaster to help you issue the warning? So I will want to talk about a couple of them. So I want to talk about some radar products that are operationally used, some satellite products, as well as lightning data. So let's look at an easy example again. That's a composite 2D reflectivity of the German radar network. And uh, what you can see here, um, you can see precipitation fields. For instance, you see this precipitation line over here and some others um, further in the southwest, uh, southeast, and some in the North Sea. So this um, product will help you in knowing what's going on and where you want to have, uh, where you have to pay attention for the next hours. Another useful product is uh, 3D radar data, so again, it's radar reflectivity. What you see here is in the middle, you see the standard 2D product, and then on the side, you would see 3D information. So what it means is here, it's the highest value in the vertical, the highest profile that occurs along this line. So it's not a real cross-section somewhere, but it's like the highest values along those lines. And for instance, here it would show you the strongest profile along this west-east axis. So here, for instance, you would see in this cell, you could see, oh, it's quite strong and high reflectivity reaching high up. And you would see this also on the west-east um, profile here. So this ha also helps the uh, forecaster to distinguish between weaker and stronger cells, because the 2D radar reflectivity scan is 
well, just showing you something at one elevation, but you also want to see whether your cloud is deep and how deep it is. Um, another product that helps you is a so-called vertical integrated liquid. So instead of looking at lots of 3D information, you could also derive some 3D information and map it on a, to a 2D grid. So what's done here is just an integration for each grid point um, over the 3D measurement. And it's useful to find, uh, to get an idea where there could be hail, to um, see where um, heavy precipitation, um, which cells could um, lead to heavy precipitation. And also you can estimate wind damage from it. So let's look at an example again. That's the same plot I showed you before. And what you can derive for those cells is just a wheel. So it's an integrated here for those two cells we saw previously. So now you have the 3D information mapped on 2D. So it makes it easier for the forecaster, instead of looking at 3D data, to just look at 2D data, but having kind of 3D information in there. And something else that the wheel is useful for if we want to zoom into the plot even more, we just see one cell left here now. And I will now click to the um, figures and you will see that within two, uh, in, within five minute time intervals, the cell will change quite a bit. So at the beginning, it will just move to the northeast, but after a while it will uh, intensify. For instance, here from the last time step to this one, you could see a strong increase in the middle. So it will tell the forecaster, oh, there's something going on with this storm. You should pay attention. So it's intensifying a lot. And this is what actually happened out of the cell. And um, the wet thing you can see here, it's not snow, it's hail. So there was quite a bit of precipitation here in this road and the cars got struck and lots of hail in the cell as well. So um, having checked the real values, um, you kind of got a hint beforehand that you will have an event like this. So let's look at some other radar data. You learned a lot already about Doppler winds from Martin yesterday or on Monday. So how is it used in operation? I want to show you an example here as well. What you see is a radial wind. And so here the green will show um, that the, um, the precipitation is approaching the radar and then it's moving further away. And here it's not coming back again, but what you also learned from Martin is that the radar has only a certain um, range. So the green values are even stronger red values. So they're even higher. So let's look at some time steps again. So first, what does the radar reflectivity field look like? It looks like this. So you will have precipitation here. And in front of those precipitation cells, you have the strongest winds event. So it's like uh, pre um, pre-convective um, gusts you will see. So if I look through those again, we will see that the strong wind field will move ahead of the precipitation cell. So, and this, so the Doppler wind product um, will give the forecast a hint that really strong convective gusts are involved with this precipitation event. And did it actually happen? Yet, yes, it did. So after a while, an hour later, we also got the um, wind measurements from weather synop stations. And there was a synop report of 12 before, which is quite strong wind, about 30 something meter per second. So using the Doppler wind beforehand, the forecaster was actually aware of what could happen in terms of wind gusts. Now I want to show you an exam other example, what the forecast that can use the radial wind for. If you remember again, that green means approaching the radar and red means moving away. If you look down here, you see that here you've got a area with, where you've got movement away from the radar and here it's coming back. So what's going on here? You can actually see a rotation down here which um, gives you a hint for mesocyclone. So checking Doppler radar doesn't only help in 
getting an idea about the strength of the gas, but also about some rotation features. So that was the kind of radar data that's used in operational um, practice. Now let's have a look at some satellite plots. That's a, probably the easiest and the nicest one to look at. What you see is an RGB image from the Meteosat satellite and it's showing Central Europe. So here's Germany and we are about here right now. And you see strong convective clouds over here in the middle to East Germany and some over Poland. And you can actually probably see a overshooting top somewhere. So you can imagine that this kind of image also helps the forecaster. And what kind of other products uh, in terms of satellite are out there? In other products, that's quite handy in terms of now casting or even a bit earlier to have a situational awareness of about what could happen in the afternoon is the so-called stability analysis imagery. It will derive the stability from the profiles measured from satellite and what's indicated here that you see in the red, reddish areas, quite strong instability. So if you would expect convection in the afternoon, you would probably guess that the vertical profile is pretty reasonable for convective development in this area and not so much in other areas around it. So let's check whether what happened actually. So that's the same day a couple of hours later and we actually see that the previous satellite product nicely indicated the area that's, um, that's good for deep convection. So this is actually what it looked like in the afternoon. And what you can see is a high resolution visible um, image from the uh, Meteosat satellite. Another product that's used in operation is an infrared image. And what you can see here is, uh, for example, you see the brightness temperature at cloud top. And here, if you look carefully, you can see a kind of a ring. So it's a yellowish orange kind of ring and a bit more greenish in the middle, and this is also a feature that's associated with severe deep convection. Of course, you can use both data together to look at a combined image of radar and satellite, and that's also used quite often. What you can see here is a movie of the 20th of June, and this is where we are now, uh, where we are now here, and if we play it again, we see that there was a nice strong cell just passing Bonn and a couple of basements in Bonn were flooded from the cell. And another cell I want to point out here is the one that we will develop down here. And you can see nicely the here in the real values, a strong development and um, relatively short time. And you actually also afterwards see the envelope spreading out in the satellite product. Another data source that's used um, in now casting a lot is lightning data. So uh, what does it look like? Again, an example from June this year. And what you can see here from lightning data, what you will get is locations of lightnings. Here the color code means that red are the current lightnings and the green ones are 30 minutes old. And you see that there was a kind of a linear convective system moving to the northeast. And you see also some um, thunderstorms here in Poland. So why should you use lightning at all? And why is it useful to look at lightning? Um, well, lightning is a threat to life, property, and safety. And it's, it, well, it's part of a thunderstorm. A thunderstorm is defined with having lightning. And the lightning electrification is a result of cloud microphysics and cloud dynamics. So if you know that you observe the lightning, you know that there has to be something going on within this cloud. And lightning is also a um, important part of the life cycle of deep convective events. And since you learned a lot about radar during the last two days, and you will learn a lot about satellites the next two days, but you haven't heard anything about lightning 
yet I want to squeeze in a bit about lightning and why we measure it, why it's important, and how we can measure it. So just in, to show you a schematic overview of a convective life cycle, each nice thunderstorm starts at a um, cloudless day with a small cumulus cloud. So you will have the first shallow cumulus cloud probably in the early afternoon. You have weak updrafts, no downdrafts. You will have water in the updraft. You will have some first super cooled um, droplets above the freezing level. And um, you will start to form ice at the beginning, but no electrification, no growl so far. Then further on, the um, cumulus cloud will deepen, so you will get stronger updrafts, some initial downdrafts as well. You will have stronger, um, yeah, bigger liquid water content. You will have more super cool drops about the freezing level, and eventually you will have formation um, of grapple in the updraft. And this is actually when the electrification or the charge separation process begins in the mid-levels. You see that you have first negative charge in the middle of the updraft. It's associated with the grapple. And you have the posi positive ice particles that are lifted up with the updraft. Then further on, the cumulus cloud will grow deeper and deeper. You still have strong updrafts. You will have already strong downdrafts. You will have lots of water, lots of ice, lots of grapple everywhere. And so you have a further charge separation. And you will have more and more negative charged grapple in the updraft and more and more positive charged um, ice particles that are lifted with the updraft and that will go into the annual as well. So, And this is also when the first cloud to ground strike occurs. So you will have a negative cloud to ground just underneath the cloud. And you will have some intra-cloud um, lightnings within the cloud. Then later on, when the um, cumulus cloud, uh, the cumulonimbus starts to die, it will dissipate, the updraft will weaken. You will have some precipitation still falling out of the cloud, but no more grapple formation and um, you will have all the, the negative um, charge re reduced from the storm, but you will still have a quite nice anvil at the top of the storm. And this is when you get your positive cloud to cloud strikes from the anvil down to the earth. So that's a kind of how um, lightning is involved in the life cycle of storms. So how can we measure lightning? I mean, we can see it, we can hear it, but how can we measure it? So we could, there are several lightning networks around the globe and several around Europe, Europe as well. The one we are using operationally is the so-called LeNet sensor. It stands for lightning network. It consists of two antennas, those two rings. It looks pretty simple. And then you've got this weird thing here. It's a GPS time sensor. It's really important to have a really accurate time um, timing of the measurement. I will tell you why in a second. And this is what the signal looks like. So you've got two signals from those two antennas. And you will get um, some larger amplitudes here and some wiggling around all of the time. And if you go those measurements not only at one station, but at several stations, you can then combine them. So if you measure the charge at different locations and you check your watch or you check your GPS time sensor, then you can compare at which time the signal arrived at which antenna. So it's a so-called time of arrival method. So if you com compare the times of the signal as a different antennas, you can then actually derive where the source is located. And you need at least four sensors to get it, to get the location in 2D as well as the location in 3D, because the light, lightning will never be underground, but it should be up there. So having four measurements, you can locate the um, lightning quite accurately. So, and the accuracy of the location of the stroke is depending on the time. So 
as better your time measurement is, as better is your location. So for this system, it's about a couple of hundred meters, so it's pretty precise. So what kind of data do we get? We get the latitude, longitude, and time of the stroke. We get the type, so we know whether it, the stroke hit the ground or whether it was intra or inner cloud. And we know the polarity, and we know the amplitude. And if it didn't hit the ground but was an inner cloud, we will also get an average height of the stroke. So that was all about squeezed in about lightning measurements. And you will see more about lightning in the second half of the talk. Now coming back to operational now casting, we saw that we can use lots of radar and satellite data to issue warnings or to help the forecaster. But there are also additional algorithms that try to um, collect data and condense the information to even more help the forecaster. So there are a couple of radar-based and some satellite-based algorithms. And the one I want to present here are some cell um, radar-based algorithms. The first one is a Conrad system. It stands for convective radar signals, convection in radar. And what it does, it uses 2D radar reflectivity on a one kilometer grid with a five minute temporal resolution. And what's done within the algorithm, it's that it sees structures that are above a certain reflectivity. So a cell within the system is defined um, if you've got at least 46 dBZ in, within an area of 12 um, square kilometers. So what you will get out of it, you will get the information of the coordinates of the cell center as well as the size of the cell and the area above um, certain dBZ thresholds. You will get an analysis and now casting in five minute time interval. So it will ha has got a high update rate and you know um, out of the system um, a now cast so you will know in which direction the cell will move within the next hour or two. And you will also get some, something that's called a hail warning flag and some heavy precipitation as well as gust warnings. So what does it mean? It's just looking at the reflectivity values and if you've got strong reflectivities, um, it tells you, oh, please pay more attention to this cell compared to another ordinary cell. So there are two thresholds, reflectivity thresholds that determines whether this cell is more likely to produce hail. It doesn't really tell you anything about whether there's hail inside, but it's more like a likelihood that you could get hail. And then additionally, it says that if the cell is moving fast, it probably will have strong gusts, but it's a quite a simple relation. What does it look like? Um, here's an example on the left. You see again the 2D radar reflectivity. On, for instance, here you see a strong signal and then the algorithm says, oh, okay, here's a cell. So um, instead of the forecaster ch checking this image really closely for high values, he could also look just on the right side and the algorithm will tell him uh, where the strongest reflectivity areas are. So there are lots of other symbols as well. What does they mean? You will get an information about where the cell is, about the cell size, it's the size of the circle, and the strength, it's the color of the circle, and then you will get many more other information about whether hail is likely or not, whether gusts are likely or not, and so on. And another information that's printed here in the image is this uh, purple lines here, and it will tell you that there is probably attenuation due to the cell. So you won't get much information behind the cell because the radar is um, located in the middle of the image. And another example of how the algorithm worked and what actually happened, that's an example which is pretty old, about 12 years ago, and you had this um, Conrad detection over here, a strong cell, and this is how the vertical um, re reflectivity profile looked like, and this is what happened at ground. So it kind of was a strong event. Then there's a second algorithm um, that's 
somewhat similar, somewhat new. Why do we do a second one? Well, it's using additional data. So the previous one just used 2D radar reflectivity, and this one also includes the lightning data, and it also includes the NWTP model forecasts. So within this product, um, you will have a cell criteria for based on radar reflectivity as well as on lightning. So the system will only um, identify a cell if it has at least one stroke within a certain area. It's an object-based approach. It's a, first, uh, it's a previous one, but it also used the model output statistic approach. And the same as with the last algorithm, there are fixed thresholds. So Whenever the cell is a bit smaller or starts to split up or the reflectivity goes down a bit for a couple of time steps, the algorithm will lose it because it has a fixed threshold. And what you get here out of it for information, you also get the coordinates of the cell as well as the cell size. And you will get it in five minute time intervals and you will get an, an now cast for the next two hours. You will get lots of um, additional parameters, maximum wind gusts, hail, some uh, cell sizes, and also some probabilities to have certain lightning rates, to have certain precipitation above those warning criteria. And another product from this system is that you will also get it not only the coordinates and the cell size, but you will also get the product mapped onto a grid. So how are those in additional parameters derived? What we have seen in the previous one, that it's only based on the cell speed. Here, um, this is an advantage from including NWP data. The wind gusts, for instance, also use information about the wind speed at two model levels, about the relative humidity, and also about the maximum reflectivity. And here for hail, again, it's um, only based on reflectivity data. And here, I have to mention, to stress again, that it's only 2D reflectivity data. So how does it look like? Again, another example. So you see the 2D radar reflectivity plot. And here, some cell detection here, some over here, and the smaller light gray boxes will show you the um, predicted cell locations for the next one to two hours. So that's a cell-based product, and the other one mapped onto a grid looks like this. This is showing you the probability to have precipitation above a certain threshold within the next hour, and mapped onto a grid. And you see that in the center of the cell track, the probability is highest, and then it's lower at the edges and if you go further in time. And then you could also look at the probability of precipitation for a different threshold. And it's obviously that the, the probability will be lower if you look at higher precipitation thresholds. So how does it look in practice? We have seen this example before. I showed you the 2D um, radar reflectivity field. And the question you would have to answer as an operational forecaster is, which hazard occurs, will the cell identify or increase, and what kind of warning should I issue? So now, what kind of help do you get from the now casting algorithms? You will know um, where there is a cell detected. You will get some cell characteristics, the size of a certain reflectivity value. You will know how old the cell was already. You will know some probabilities of having hail, of having certain precipitation, um, and so on. So it will give you information about the current status of the cell, as well as about its history, not so much about its future, because um, there's kind of life cycle information in there, but not really. It's mainly based on assuming that the cell will have the same characteristics forever on. And within those set, um, systems, the cell will never die. So it will be predicted whenever it's detected, there will also be an outcast. So the other question you will have to answer is how fast will the cell move and in which direction? That's also shown with those two systems. So both Selmos and Conrad will tell you in which direction will the cell move. So in half an hour, it's um, estimated to be just east of the previous location. 
Another useful algorithm is the so-called meso de mesocyclone detection algorithm. Just a reminder, what is a mesocyclone? The mesocyclone, per definition of the AMS glossary, is a cyclone retiating vortex. It's around 2 to 10 kilometers in diameter. It's a convective storm, and yeah, it's also called a super time sometimes. You will have strong updrafts, you will have severe weather with it, and some of the mesocyclones will pro produce tornadoes as well. So can we detect them in radar? Well, maybe, sometimes. So this is what a vortex field would look like in a textbook or in model simulations. You would see a rotation over here, and this is what it would look like um, in Doppler radar. So you would see this dipole structure here. You would have um, areas where the um, where the uh, wind is coming towards the radar and um, here and where it's going away from the radar. And if you do a cross section through the vortex, this is what you will see in radar. So you will see like this dipole structure and the strength of the dipole or the amplitude is dependent on the beam width. So if you've got a, a narrower beam, you will have a more pronounced dipole. And if you have a broader beam, it doesn't look as good, but it look, will look smoother. So that's what it looks in the textbook. How does it look in a real example? On the left, you see a kind of deep, uh, deep dipole as before, but not as clearly as in this super nice example. And on the right, you also see cross sections through the dipole, and you can see the structure as well. Even you, you see a lot of noise around it. So that was actually a mesocyclone detected uh, three years ago, and associated with this mesocyclone was a tornado rated F3, so quite a strong one. Uh, so how does the algorithm works in detail. It looks at this um, Doppler wind field and derives those pattern vectors, so where you've got a gradient in the Doppler field. And then um, it will combine these vectors into one feature. And it will do the same for every sweep, so for every elevation scan. And then it will group those um, features for each elevation angle into one meso object um, as defined as a mesocyclone detected in radar. And then it will look out for certain reflectivity thresholds, for the wheel, for the height of the mesocyclone, and so on. And then it will derive a severity level um, to get an estimate how strong, how deep the cell is. And that's another example. So you see here again the 2D radar reflectivity field. See a nice hook echo over here. And this triangle tells you that the mesocyclone detection algorithm actually detected a mesocyclone here in purple, which is quite strong. And this is hap what happened during the whole day. So you see that all those colorful points here are the spots where the algorithm detected a mesocyclone. It already detected one at 12.15, and then further one until two hours later. And within this green um, circle here, this is where there was actually a tornado track observed at the ground. You see a nice tornado image here. And there was quite some destruction from this tornado. And you can see that the mesocyclone nicely um, saw the feature and tracked it and actually increased in severity. So purple is stronger compared to yellow and then it decreased again. So I showed you a couple of algorithms that will give you some information about the cell, but you still as a forecaster, you still have to think about what kind of warning should I issue in what kind of country and so what kind of county, not country. Usually you're just responsible for one country. So there's an algorithm that tries to integrate all those nice detection algorithms into one. So all those information like Conrad, Salmos, the lightning, the wheels, some radar products, synapse observation, as well as high resolution NWP goes into this black box, or here it's a green box. And then some magi magic fuzzy logic will happen. And afterwards, you will get some categorical warning out of it. So you will get an information 
what warning I should issue in which county. And the warning categories are the same I showed you before, so you will get information whether the thunderstorm will have gusts at which strengths, a combination with having certain um, precipitation threshold as well as having hail or no hail. And that's an example we have seen already before. I showed you to show the wheel product. And what you see here in gray is what the Nowcast mix algorithm suggests. So it digests all the information from other observations from all cell detection algorithms and suggests you that within this circle you should issue a warning. And what we see in orange is the actually warnings that were already issued, so it quite helped um, to see what counties you should warn on. I now want to just show you a quick example about satellite because you will learn lots more about satellite products during the next day. And the example I want to show you here is a so-called convective initiation. You will learn everything about it from John tomorrow. I just want to show an example here. So what it shows you here, you can see a um, high resolution visible plot from MSG. You see a couple of cumulus cloud fields, but the algorithm is supposed to indicate which clouds have got potential to, deep high, uh, to grow higher, which have a strong um, convective development, which are developing fast. So in this example, the algorithm suggested that those cells will deepen. And this is what happened later. A couple of hours, they were really deepened a lot. And you've got this huge convective cloud systems here. But that's just a teaser for tomorrow afternoon's talks. So that's the current status. That's how now casting is done in operations so far. But um, can we improve it? You learned a lot about polarimetric radar. You will learn a lot about satellite tomorrow. And it was more from a um, research pr perspective. And as, as you've seen here, um, the operations doesn't use those new instruments, all of them yet. And a new um, center or a new initiative that was founded a couple of years ago is the so-called Hans Adel Center for Weather Research. Um, it's a collaboration between German universities, the National Weather Service, as well as research institutes. It's supposed to strengthen the research um, in the field of weather prediction and to have a joint effort and research together from the operational perspective as well as the academic perspective. There are five branches within this Hans Adel Center. Um, one about atmospheric dynamics and predictability. It's based here in Bonn as well as in the Tropis Institute in Leipzig. And then there's another one about data assimilation located in Munich, another one about model development in Hamburg, one about climate monitoring and diagnostics in Bonn and Cologne, and another one about the optimal use of weather information and weather warnings um, for the society. So, we want to show you now what we are doing in our project um, here in Bonn and in Leipzig and in Offenbach. So our project within this branch of atmospheric dynamics and predictability is called OASA. It stands for Object-Based Analysis and Seamless Prediction. Um, and you've got, you already met a couple of people working in the project and you will meet some more the next day. So, the research group consists of Silke, myself, Teresa, Malte, Jürgen here in Bonn, as well as Fabian and Arkosch and also Hartwig in Leipzig. So what we do in our project and how it's related to remote sensing and now casting especially, uh, what we are doing is we try to compose the data. So we want to look at, have a synergetic view on the thing. So we are developing a high resolution 3D radar and satellite and lightning based composite. We will do object based weather analysis to learn more about the life cycle of cells. We will develop a new 3D tracking algorithm. You learned before that most of the algorithms are just using 2D informations and only from one source. So either radar or satellite or lightning. But here we will have a combination of sources. And we also will use this data set to improve um, numerical weather prediction. So um, let's look at a 
forecast you could typically have. And let's look at how our project could deal with uh, or could try to improve a standard forecast. So imagine you have a forecast over a certain time and you look at, at the skill of the forecast and what you would want to have is that the skill is great and it's great for however long you will forecast. But unfortunately, that's not really likely in reality. What really happens in reality is that you will have a good skill at the beginning and it will get worse over time. So at the beginning, um, now casting will be better than NWP modeling. Why? Because it's using observations and observations are the best information you get for the current status. But after a while, um, the cells will develop, they will change their sh shape and so on. So after the while, the skill of the now casting will decrease and then the skill of the NWP model will eventually be better as the now casting, but you will have a discontinuity in the middle when you overlap from one um, to the other. And there are some current developments in Germany going on right now that will help to improve this in the near future, as you had already yesterday. The DWD radar network is upgraded to dual polarimetry, and we have a new 3D five minutes scan strategy. There are lots of data assimilation product, uh, projects going on as well. So what do we do in our product uh, project? Let's look at the two components separately. First, we want to look at now casting. So the skill decrease with time. And what we try to do in our project, we want to try to decrease it less fast. So we to try to improve the skill a bit and how can we do so? I just said we have a comprehensive multi-sensor data set that we will use. We will include some life cycle informations into the tracking algorithms, into the now casting products. We will have a new tracking algorithm. And on the other hand, how can we um, help to improve the NWP model? We can also use a multi-sensor data set it can be used for model validation on an object-based perspective, as well as um, to help to understand model errors, as we have seen in the previous talk today. And um, we can also use this data set to do assimilation. So once we have hopefully um, um, improved the skill of both, then we, if we do a comparative verification, we can judge which system works better in which time frame, and then we can finally um, blend those two methods, uh, now casting as well as the NWP model, and then come to a kind of seamless prediction that hopefully is better than the current operational systems. So that was the first part from my side, and now Zilke will show you much more about our project.